Thanks for listening to The Derivative. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. I think the next next year gets really interesting jeff because u.s production is expected to fall by 3.1 percent um due to the drought that you've got so herd liquidation um the usda's latest figures um we've got brazil with their expectation of a seven percent fall argentina's had its own headaches this year with their quota scheme that the government introduced um liquidation, I think, going on in Uruguay, and Indian buffaloes have struggled to get out in, into the global market because of COVID. So it gets kind of interesting to me, Jeff, because beef supply next year is going to tighten, I think, dramatically. 3% out of the US, has just said, 7% out of Brazil, you know, and a, an 8% fall out of Argentina. And when you add that together, just those three alone, that's 2.1 million tons less beef globally. That points to higher prices beef-wise around the world. All right. Hi, everybody. We're switching things up today in what's going to be a new series on the pod here. Uh, we talk with hedge fund guys and derivatives traders speculating on markets like oil and bonds and VIX and more all the time. Uh, and you can almost forget when digging into a quants model or a trend followers approach that there's actual grown in the ground physical commodities behind much of the trading that takes place here. Uh, indeed, the Board of Trade, Chicago Board of Trade, started out as a way for those with a crop in the ground to hedge the risk that something goes wrong before the harvest. Uh, So without further ado, welcome to our new Way More Than You Wanted to Know series, which we'll be doing quarterly on markets like cotton, lumber, natural gas, and more, uh, and bringing in Jeff Eisenberg, who I've worked with for over 20 years and who hosts RCM's other podcast, The Hedge Edge, each month. Say that 10 times fast, Hedge Edge. Uh, Each month, talking with hedgers and traders in the world of physical commodities. Uh, So to start things off here on our first episode, way more than he wanted to know about meats with our guest, Simon Quilty. He of Wangarata. Did I say that even close? I Wangarata. think you're close. Wang- Wangarata, the Aboriginal. Wang- <laughs> he of Wangarata, Australia, that booming town of about 20,000 people, uh, about 150 miles northeast of Melbourne. How did I do with Melbourne? I know you guys don't like that R in there, right? Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, so before we dive in, tell us about your little town there. How, how in the world you ended up there? Uh, it's my family, it's my wife's family's uh, town, and my own family grew up an hour away. So it's um, it's a classic love story of shepherd and boy meet when you're at a girl, and uh, we met at university um, in dancing classes. So um, wow. down in Melbourne. And then, uh, Jeff Eisner, you had a story about Simon in Tiananmen Square. Yeah, I uh, had the opportunity to meet Simon. Uh, boy, it's, uh, it's been over a year ago now. And uh, as we've gotten to know each other, one of the first things he tells me is that uh, he happened to be in Tiananmen Square in 1989. And I you know, immediately stopped the presses. Let's just start over. Uh, what happens and how do you even get out of there? Quickly is my advice. <laughs> <laughs> the tanks are rolling in and it's time to go. And you tell yeah. me that someone actually handed you a plane ticket. Is, is that real? Is that, is that how it happened? Yeah, yeah. That was about five days into, um, you might say, the siege. Um, okay. So it was, yeah, it was a pretty difficult time. And the country was in lockdown. You know, two factions of the army fighting each other. 
Tiananmen Square was as bloody as you can imagine. I think yeah. there was 14,000 people killed students during it. Um, and I'd been there the day of the, uh, the massacre and left that evening unknowing that the, the, the tanks were about to roll through about three or four hours later. So um, I ended up in a small town outside of Shanghai called Suzhou and uh, there hunkered down for four days as gradually the information traveled through. But in 1989, no internet, we had TV, but, but no phones. So information was not what it is today. Well, you're here to tell the story, so uh, we're, we're glad to have you. And um, thanks, Jeff, for having me on the, uh, the, the derivative, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. Let's do it. Uh, yeah. And so were you doing Meats way back then, and what was it, 89? No, I was um, had my first job out of university. I did an ag science degree, and I was with a lobby group called the Victorian Farmers Federation. And I was on a mercy flight out and landed in Hong Kong as the, and the plane erupted applauding, um, just glad to get out. Yeah. And I sent a fax, if you know what faxes are, yeah. saying, hold the press, don't, you know, stop advertising for a new research officer, I will be back, all right? <laughs> so back. that was my fear that they'd just say, oh boy, we've lost him and let's find a new research officer. I love it. Um, so if we can, I kind of want to start talking meats, exactly what that means, um, right? Us in the futures world, we have cattle futures, we have hog futures, uh, but there's poultry, there's sheep, uh, there's all sorts of things going on in your meat world. So if you could just give us, let's start with a big 30,000 foot overview. Uh, sure. 30,000 feet probably doesn't do it in the world of meats, right? Because we got to look at the whole globe. So let's say yeah. 3,000 miles up. And you got yeah, some slides well, here you're going to show us. So go for that's it. That's right. I just just to help clarify things. So um, you know the total amount produced globally of beef is about 73 million tons, poultry about 124 million tons, and pork 110 million tons. And sheep meat is a poor cousin to all of them at 15 million tons. I think what's clear here is that half of the hog population once resided in China itself. So you could almost halve that uh, picture there for pork in half and say that's where, you know, half the world's pork come from. So mm -hmm. uh, it, during African swine fever, that changed and it's slightly less today, but once it, the message is the same. China is, is huge on pork not only for its own production, but what it imports. And I'm going to test your math here, but maybe you can tell me if uh, how many pounds are in a ton? Uh, 2.20462 to be wow. exact. Nice. So there's what I was just roughly summing that up. There's about 350 million tons there. So yeah. So it, I'm trying to get to, is there more, more pounds than people per year? So uh, Every person on the Correct. planet has a couple of pounds of protein. That's right. And, and we're going to look at that ratio, but that's about 770 million, you know, um, well, I have to times that by another thousand to um, give it in pounds equivalent. But so 7.7 7 billion pounds. Yeah. Correct. You guys are doing some high level math here. I think we need to uh, get back to the metric system. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> We may be a long time waiting for America to do that. But, um, so, you know, breaking it up, um, this is a, a, a somewhat simplistic approach, but the four main players in global protein production is the USA, Brazil, EU, and China. And as we've said, China really consumes pretty well everything it produces. So the, those figures, yes, 46 million tonnes produced in America, um, of protein, 28 in Brazil, 45 in the EU, and about 65 million um, tons within China. Um, so when we break it up into pork, you can see that China's lost a bit of ground with African swine fever, but at 44 million tons, um, they're the largest producer globally. And 
it's about a third, um, you know, America's about a third of China's total volume. Um, the EU sits closer to slightly below half um, or at half, and then Brazil's comes in at 4 million. And then when we look at poultry, once again, China is dominant. Um, America's just below half the poultry production. And then you've got Brazil and the EU running an equal third. And then last but not least is beef. And they're all pretty close in that 7 to 13 million tonnes globally produced in beef. And then Australia and Argentina are fairly sizable in their own rights. Um, and what's more important is how much goes export. So when we look at population, Jeff, both Jeffs, and here I've got, you know, the size, you might say, within um, China of their population of 1.4 billion. And then you look at the EU that falls dramatically to 512, Brazil's only 212 million, and America at 331. So you can see that there's excess production or supply occurring versus population if, you know, China is meeting its own needs. So the net effect is that that excess supply here really equals the exports. And that to me is, is what's crucial is the role that the US, Brazil and the EU play in export markets for each of these proteins. And it's you know, obviously going to be sizable as we move forward. And so these are at the estimates. Sorry. Just those three, US, Brazil and EU are something like what, 80% of all exports of meats around the world? Pretty well, they dominate it, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, it varies from year to year. What the USDA haven't recorded in the last year is the role of India and Buffalo. And in actual fact, between the US, Brazil, well, Australia and India, we all vie for the top beef spot each year. And it sits somewhere around one and a half million tonnes um, per year. So, yes, um, the um, it's pretty sizable, all those players. Simon, so I have a question on, on that. So is this all because of the arable land and, and or technology? What drives it to be you know, happening only in the US and China, Brazil? I mean, why, why is it not happening more out of Europe? Or you know, is China going to be able to catch up because of the technology? I mean, this seems, seems out of balance to me. Yeah, I think one, you know, the fact that there are so many people, 1.4 billion in China, they're running out of space. Yeah. And that their land has been worked so hard for so long um, that the ability to expand is limited. Whereas the US production system is very intensive. So corn makes up, you know, 90% in terms of cattle feed, 90% of all animals are on corn for 150 days. So there's different reasons for different countries. America's large production is because you've become very good at intensive agriculture. And that occurs in hogs and in chickens as well. And I looked Brazil, up right before we got on here, uh, I was wondering about that, how much of our corn and soybean production goes to feed. And uh, it seems to me the, the, all the data I read between 40 and 50% of all corn produced in the US is going to feed and 75 percent soybeans so you know it's uh because we're the largest producer of grain naturally it's easier to also raise the cattle and pigs and swine here in the in the u.s you bet and jeff add to that now ethanol production is a yeah. critical that part of that yeah. yeah it's just tightened that need and it's a three-way contest between human consumption energy and uh and the livestock needs. Um, so, yes, in terms of exports, um, USA, Brazil, and the EU dominate. Um, and, you know, part of the challenge is with droughts, flooding, and the uncertainty globally about markets is that those, you know, volumes change dramatically every year. And the ability to hedge or manage risk is challenging for a lot of markets. I mean, Brazil has a live cattle market. 
but it's really very much for domestic um, hedging and I think somewhat limited, to be honest. The EU, there's nothing there. China has just in the last three or four months introduced a hog contract that's very loose and somewhat driven, I think, by external interests, namely the government. Um, truly, the US is the only place globally that with confidence, I think, manages price risk better than anywhere else in the world. Love it. So, get more into that. I had two quick questions. One, Buffalo, you mentioned in India. That's not the Buffalo that us Americans think about. That's not bison. No. It's or is water it bison? buffalo. Water buffalo. It is. Okay. It's, a, it's a relation, um, but it's water buffalo. But it is um, a cheap, lean meat product and is 100% of it goes globally. So, the size of the water buffalo herd in India is 110 million head, wow. and that's it's a byproduct really of their dairy herd, which is 310 million head. So a third of it's made up of buffalo, the dairy herd, and two thirds regular dairy type animals. So 100% of buffalo is exported because of relig religious reasons, whether but cow meat cannot be exported because the cow is sacred. So there you have um, India is a very important player and pricing wise sits at about half the price of Australian and US beef globally. And then somewhere in between Australia um, and the US pricing, which is very high, sits Brazil in between India and us, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, it's a very competitive product and plays an important role in what we call secondary markets, such as the Middle East. And what do they use? Like, I'm not going to go into a restaurant and see water buffalo steak, right? So is it used in dog it, food or like what, what kind of stuff is it? Uh, no, no, it's used in manufacturing for, you know, producing um, meatballs, hamburgers, um, ground beef. Um, it's a slow cooked item. Um, but it's it's used right across Southeast Asia and uh, and the Middle East. Okay. Um, what about kangaroo? Come on, uh, we, we I don't see kangaroo on the list here, Simon. And you know you're in Australia, so tell us uh, what was the story you told me? There's two Australians for every kangaroo. Is that what it is? Uh, it might. It's getting closer to I think three. I think it sits at about sixty million. Uh, 66 million head of kangaroo. And um, one of the ways you measure the size of the population is you drive down our main freeway and the number of roadkill you count kind of reflects the size of the herd, I think. So um, last trip I went on, there was something like 30 kangaroos on the side of the road. So, yeah, there's a lot of them. And you, you, you told us Australia is the only country that puts roadkill on its uh, flag, right? <laughs> That's correct. We are proud of our roadkill, can I tell you? <laughs> so, um, so as we move along from um, looking at who the major players are, Jeff and Jeff, um, the standouts are Cargill, Tyson, Vion, Smithfield, JBS and BRF. And when you home in on who is just the extraordinary um, participant there across all those protein sectors, it's JBS. They're the number one beef producer in the world, um, situated in four different countries. They're the number one poultry producer in the world, once again, across four separate countries. And then you've got, um, in terms of pork, they're number two. Their net global revenue is $52.4 billion. And to me, this is a really interesting sucks in so many ways. When, you know, dietary needs are changing and chicken's cheaper than pork or beef, JBS is still a recipient or a winner out of that. And when there's droughts and floods in North America, but not in Australia, JBS is once again a winner out of that because, you know, things change globally and they have a footprint everywhere. 
and then add to that foreign exchange as well. So I think it's a, it's a model that they have truly shown how to, you might say, spread your supply risk. And they really leverage this to the maximum. Where, where are they headquartered? Their uh, headquarters in Brazil. Yeah. Okay. And like, yeah. so I know Smithfield, everyone in the US knows Tyson for the most part, but we're not used to buying JBS bacon or something. So uh, yeah. it's, they're not a, a brand name, right? They're, so they're just behind the scenes providing all this. They, they have a number of um, Pilgrim's Pride is probably the, the, I think the number one one that you would know of. Um, uh, so, and then Smith, Smithfield used to be a U.S. company, and then the Chinese bought Smithfield, right? Or at least the WH company. Group, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and that really puts, I guess, in terms of that tie between China and the U.S., it really strengthens that, of course, with pork mm. being such an important part of the, the Chinese diet and the real concern or need for some security when it comes to food supply. And if I, if so, I have 10 million uh, tons of pork produced in a Smithfield plant in the U.S., does that count as Chinese production or U.S. production? Uh, that's U.S. production. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> but I like the way you're thinking. Um, yeah. Probably. So what I think is interesting about these revenue for last year is – Cargill in the middle there stands out at 135 billion. And I think you've got to separate out their meat interests from their grain and all their other um, value added businesses they've got. So, you know, they are a trading house in their own right, you know, whether it's energy um, or the various commodities we, we're familiar with. They value add, they've got an enormous number of. Um, brand names in the frozen food sector in America. Um, they are very strong, obviously. They're present in Australia. They're in America. They have offices all over the world, production places all over the world. Um, they're the standout in terms of size. Um, but it, when we just isolate pure protein interest, JBS is also the standout in my mind. So these guys are huge, which is what we're showing here. Right? Everywhere from four billions, the smallest player, up to uh, fifty billion, purely just on proteins for JBS. So how do they how do they think about this market? Like, what are their what are their concerns? Are they constantly worrying about having to hedge this fifty billion in in revenue? Yeah, I, as I alluded to, currencies play a huge role, and so. They're, um, they're continually looking at um, which of their countries they've got the best foreign exchange and therefore there's that um, comparative advantage at that point in time that they will capitalise on. Um, I think like every company in the world at the moment, labour is an issue. And right here, all these companies are struggling with having enough labour. So this is not just a problem in America, not just a problem in Australia, it's a global problem. And how these companies address that is one of the challenges. Maybe JBS is in a unique situation that once the borders open up, they, due to their enormous network, could possibly draw on some of that labour and, and relocate it to where it's most needed over in their global operations. I don't know, but I do know that labor is one of the critical factors, Jeff. Well, and, and shipping, right? So you start seeing in the news here, we've got Walmart uh, buying their own ships, Cargill buying their own ships. I mean, these companies here probably on comparison are near the size of some of these large US uh, uh, wholesalers. Are, are we going to see JBS owned ships, Cargill owned ships and you know, that they're going to be trying to ensure food security. And maybe even another question is, are countries like China and the U.S. going to sit there and say, we need to make sure that our food supply is, is uh, uh, protected and help these companies secure shipping lines? I mean, 
Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, a lot it's a really of, uh, interesting. Unknown. It is. Um, look, I do know, it, even within Australia, New Zealand, that chartering of vessels is occurring more and more. Yeah. So effectively, you're not owning it, but you're taking control of that vessel over a, a full year or whatever is required. Um, there's no doubt that the last year and the last six months has made all these major players rethink about that logistic risk. Um, and then on top of that, Jeff, is cold storage facilities across America are very tight and in lots of countries around the world. So it's not only getting it from point A to point B, but I think once you're inside those countries, I mean, the fact that it takes eight to 12 weeks for one container of Australian beef to be entered into China through Shanghai at the moment speaks volumes. And so take, take us through a little journey of what that looks like. So I'm a nice Australian uh, cow there. And what happens to me? I get well, rounded you, up, I get slaughtered. What's, what's that journey look like? You could, well, you know, uh, you'll probably end up going um, to three different, four different destinations because every market has different needs. So your life is, you know, if you wanted to travel overseas, you're simultaneously going to four separate countries as parts of you are shipped out. Um, you're drawn and quartered and a quarter to each part of the world. Perfect. Yes. Um, so Korea, the US, um, Japan and China dominate the Australian landscape and about 80% of our exports go to just those four destinations. So um, you tend to find that the US takes the higher end stuff at times if it's chilled. If it's not, if it's cow meat, you'll go as in as 90 CL to end up in a hamburger. Um, in China, they take everything. They'll take the highest value wagyus that we produce and the lowest value cow meat. And there's a place for everything um, within China. Japan, they are very selective. Often it's chilled, often it's grain fed, and it's very high end. Though that market has been struggling in recent months. And then Korea, much of it is bone in product. Um, so ribs um, and the likes. So, Jeff, it depends on what cut yeah. you are, is but where I'm, you end up. Thinking more of like it gets slaughtered somewhere there, it gets put on a train. Does it get frozen on site? Like, what does that whole thing look yes, like? Yes, it gets frozen on site in Australia and then okay. truck to a port and then shipped out. Um, and so, you know, the major cities, Brisbane, uh, Sydney, Melbourne, are where the bulk of the, um, the product goes out, um, Brisbane being the largest hub for beef out of Australia. So, yes. And then if, um, if there's any of these issues like we have in Long Beach of containers coming in and they're delayed months, that stuff spoils, right? You have to get it out of it the... It does. Yeah. So you... You raise a really good point that um, of with all the slowness that's going on globally with entries into ports due to the, um, the bottlenecks that are happening. For example, on the east coast of America, it's 21 days average time to get a product cleared. In Japan and Korea, it's two weeks. And as we said, within uh, China, it's now six to eight weeks. So... What happens there is that chilled beef, chilled lamb has a certain shelf life. And we're just seeing in the export figures that companies are pulling away from exporting chilled because of shelf life, because of the concern of this long, long period of time before the product actually ends up on the supermarket shelf. Right. And what's the, so if they pull back from chilled, what's the alternative? Jerky? Fro frozen. Total. Oh, okay. So, so chilled is, what's the difference there? Chilled and frozen. Well, basically, when you're selling something as chilled, you, it goes in a form that um, when you freeze something, the meat is somewhat denatured to a certain extent. Um, the quality is not as good. Whereas with chilled, you know, it comes out fresh and eats well immediately um, and retains a lot of that tenderness, whereas by freezing, you're taking away some of that freshness. 
Okay. So the, the market prefers chilled if it can afford it and grain fed chilled in particular. Simon, this is starting to sound like a, like a start to a bad joke or something. What happens when we take you to a, uh, a steak restaurant in Chicago? You, you're going to you know, be critiquing all of uh, the, the meat that comes across the plate or what? Well, um, dare I say, I may be saying this steak is not good enough. Oh. <laughs> all right. All right. To be honest, I've never done that in America. I've never had a bad meal in America. Um, I can't say that about India, but I can say that about America. Perfect. We'll take it. Um, and I think the next, next year gets really interesting, Jeff, because U.S. production is expected to fall by 3.1%. Um, due to the drought that you've got. So herd liquidation, um, the USDA's latest figures. Um, we've got Brazil with an expectation of a 7% fall. Argentina's had its own headaches this year with their quota scheme that the government introduced. Um, liquidation, I think, going on in Uruguay. And Indian buffaloes have struggled to get out in, into the global market because of COVID. So... It gets kind of interesting to me, Jeff, because beef supply next year is going to tighten, I think, dramatically. 3% out of the US, as just said, 7% out of Brazil, you know, and an 8% fall out of Argentina. And when you add that together, just those three alone, that's 2.1 million tonnes less beef globally. That points to higher prices beef-wise around the world. Jeff, you can't put this out. Uh, all the hedge funds are going to be piling in and uh, following <laughs> your, your Twitter here, trying to figure out what to do. They just, boom, they already know what to do. Um, and it, tighten that up for me. If, if I'm tighten it, no pun intended, but I'm having trouble thinking, is that to me, when you say the supply is tightening, that the herd goes down? <laughs> That's correct. Has but if the herd goes down, you had to kill it slaughter it and then you have more supply right so what what well that, that happened like? during we're in that phase right now and the okay. markets absorbed that and still we've had rising prices so you always know demand's good is when supply is up and still prices continue to rise so next year with a contraction in supply globally expect even higher prices got it and you can't right the cure for high prices is high prices as they say right like you'll just the producers will kill more to make more money, but then they get behind the eight ball and they don't have the, they can't refresh it fast enough, I guess. Right. And then, and uh, the other That's thing, right. and part yeah. of this, well, one of the unique parts about this rising global meat prices is really China. Again, it's about the losses due to African swine fever. So we had back in 2018, the first case occurred in August. 19 was the big year of liquidation where we think close to 65% of the herd was lost. They were rebuilding. And then this year they ran into second and third waves of African swine fever. No different to the Delta variant that we're familiar with COVID. Well, they had their own variants wow. and they lost huge amounts. And then it went from a disease liquidation into an economic liquidation where now, for the last eight weeks, they've been losing somewhere between 60 to 80 US dollars a head, and farmers are exiting the industry. So we think somewhere between 30 to 50 percent has been lost already in terms of their herd size again as they retreat. And by the end of this year, if that continues, that rate of loss, it will be closer to 50 percent. So that's supporting those global markets. And will, will the people eat the disease pig? Do they slaughter it and try and sell it or it just gets burned? Well, what so what happens? Why prices fall so quickly and at 65% to be exact since January is what we call the rush to the door, whereby, Jeff, you're far better off selling the pig even though it's not properly finished and get something for it than to get nothing. Hmm. So the farmers just said, I'm not going to wait for the disease. I'm just going to sell the pigs. Yeah, yeah. Right. The Why fatten it up only for it to get sick and then you're then you're done. 
die and you get nothing. So there's, we've seen that rush to the door occur for most of this year. But the net effect is it's left this protein hole that once again will support global meat prices, whether it's poultry, beef or pork, I think for the next three years to say the minimum. And what, what do you say to write it? I'm jumping off script here a little bit, but right, we have trade wars with China and you could argue like China can never get all that strict with us because they need all our protein. Um, but I could also argue if they could just dictate that nobody gets protein for the next five years, right? They could really lay down the iron law and say, this is how it's going to be. You don't get any pork till the next five years till we bring back the herd. Yeah. Unfortunately, as you rightly point out, high prices fix high prices. Um, and even China has its limits. So oh, yeah, you'd have another bout of Tiananmen Square. <laughs> exactly. People have to eat. And, and so that your point's correct, Jeff, that you know, there is this need and desire to have a certain amount of imports to make up for the shortfall. Um, but nonetheless, their economy, I think, is probably more like a two-speed economy. We've seen the inner parts of China struggle. The outer region, coastal regions, probably are doing exceptionally well because of the export-driven recovery. So depending on where you sell to in China, but I think in some respects, Jeff, they've stumbled in terms of the economic recovery. So therefore, the ability to pay high prices is somewhat limited. Let's move on to how all these big players we talk about, what you do day in, day out, uh, what Jeff and our ag group does. How do they think about hedging this stuff? What tools are in the toolbox? Um, And go from there. So we've got, as I said earlier at the start, that the US provides, I think, one of the best risk management um, options in the world in terms of what can be done. And so the live cattle futures, um, that's based um, on the finished animal, and that's been on feed for about 150 days. The size of each trade is about 40,000 pounds. Um, And then you've got on top of that, the feeder cattle futures. And so that effectively, the difference between the feeder cattle and the live cattle is the weight and the cost of grain to get the animal to that finished state. Once again, that trades in 40,000 pound increments. And those two are critical, but let's quickly look at the lean hog futures as well. Real and, quick, is there anything magical about this 40,000 pound number? Is that like what? No, no, it's just been an industry standard that, that, has been in place for years and and suits, I guess, the um, the lot sizes within America. Yeah, we um, learned on a, a, our lumber group, the uh, what's that contract size, 108 board feet or something like 110, that? 110,000 board feet. Right, yeah. which is what fits on a flatbed rail car. Sure. So I'm sure it's so, probably grounded in something similar of like, that's what can fit in a refrigerated truck or something. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So... And, and that is correct. You know, we see that within, we use 40,000 pounds when it comes to imported meat as well. Um, so what lean hog of- futures, um, that too is worked in 40,000 pound increments. Now, what gets interesting here is that during COVID last year, that the price difference between the live stock futures contract, whether it's live cattle, feeder or hogs, during that period in which suddenly workers got sick, panic buying, you saw retail prices in America and wholesale prices go through the roof. At times it doubled. And at the same time, livestock prices fell. So if you were using hog futures or live cattle futures to price manage or price risk manage meat, you were upside down. It was not a good hedge because suddenly instead of covering you on a market that's going higher, you actually were going lower because it was against the live cattle. So the CME in its wisdom developed another contract and this is the hog um, or pork cutout contract. So 
this effectively is the cutout is like the wholesale prices of all the various components of the animal glued back together to give the carcass price value. And as I said, it's all the meat without the bones. That's it, yes. <laughs> so, so once again, this was introduced about six months ago with the real purpose, Jeff, of trying to provide risk management so that that um, discourse that occurred because of um, the disruption in supply of cattle, the bottleneck in the meatworks, and the fact that prices to the consumer doubled, that won't occur with this contract because this will reflect that retail demand and wholesale demand, not more so than the livestock demand, if that makes sense. Is it a little, my brain goes to, it's like crude oil futures, which is the oil in the ground versus gasoline futures, which is the refined stuff ready for the consumer. So the, yeah, so the live cattle and the lean hogs are the live actual thing that produces the thing people need to buy. And then the cutout is the refined product, so to speak. The finished, exactly. The finished um, product. So your quick study there, Jeff. Good work. Thanks. Only been doing yeah. it 30 years. <laughs> so if we look at where the market is today, Jeff, and it looks like to me we're heading back to more of a traditional pattern, it, prices have been truly elevated for most of this year. And I think that that's a strong reflection on demand, the, the bounce back effect as America climbs its way out of the, a COVID driven um, market from last year. We've seen the discretionary spending that's been going on. It's been extraordinary. And I think a lot of this is reflected in strong demand and to a certain extent, um, supply. And what's important here too is global export markets. So the hog market um, or or pork, about 26% of it goes export. And so the demand in China is absolutely critical in helping elevate, as well as other countries, the value of the carcass itself. And interestingly, too, when you look here at cattle, um, and you can see that extraordinary spike here, Jeff, last year when that squeeze was on um, and we saw here's the beef cutout value um, where prices just went through the roof and cattle, live cattle prices fell. But here's the, the, the beef cutout. Once again, we're moving probably more into a traditional seasonal low. Um, and then as we get towards your um, uh, season in terms of festivities and Christmas, um, Thanksgiving, it'll start to pick itself back up. And help, I'm just going to dig in on this uh, chart for a second. So that spike is post COVID when everyone's going to the grocery store and emptying out the shelves, like super all time high in demand for finished product. Um, yes. Got it. Okay. So that's what spiked in the, the live product had trouble keeping up. That's correct. And uh, workers were sick. The yeah. availability of labour was absolutely limited. Um, and therefore, the cattle couldn't be processed. So they fell in value. And there was a restricted amount of meat coming out of the system. And therefore, consumers were willing to pay a lot more for it. Right. So, I'll go back to my oil example, right? Katrina shuts in all the refining in New Orleans. Um, there's plenty of crude oil. Crude oil is cheap. You can buy all the oil you want. But the gasoline is super expensive because nobody can refine it. That's right. So at the time, I think on a per head basis, the pricing or the profits got up to around about um, 1,500 US dollars per head in America, even higher. So last year and a good portion of this year, revenue or returns for meat processes, but in particular beef, have been extraordinary. Well, Simon, I think uh, to to take a moment here, I think it's important to uh, articulate to Jeff and the uh, the listeners the difference between what we've been talking about, which is CME prices versus the wholesale price, and then how to actually manage that risk. And reality is that there is a mechanism in the meat cuts that is not readily available in many other markets like energy, like Jeff suggested, 
grains in particular uh, via the swaps and OTC markets that, um, that you and I work on on a day-to-day basis. And I think it's really important to, uh, to bring this up because it's a somewhat of an unknown market to many, to many. And quite honestly, uh, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for, for people to consider those markets for both hedging and even maybe even speculators. I'd be interested in your opinion. Yeah, that's exactly right. So as we said, you know, the, um, that squeeze that you see right in front of you there, that in pork, they've done the pork cutout, but in beef, there is no CME um, hedging mechanism for that processed um, item. So Jeff's 100% right that the way in which the market is now looking to manage that risk is using swaps. So uh, we've got market makers and people we deal with, end users, speculators on a day-to-day basis that are continually pricing up um, beef. It's uh, 90s and 50s, um, fresh 90s, fresh 50s based off the USDA um, weekly average. But we can take that hedging right through to the carcass itself um, or to individual items, depending on the items that, that's involved. But, you know, the more items, the better, the, um, the, the sharper the pricing becomes. So that can Define be... Define those things, what are 90s and 50s? So 90 CL is fresh 90s. That's how we measure grinding meat. And, uh, you know, a hamburger is a blend of 50s and 90s. So a 50 CL um, grinding meat is fat meat. 90 CL is lean meat. And you blend the two. CL is cut lean lean or something lean? Chemical lean. Chemical lean, okay. And and it's the way in which the industry for, you know, 50, 60, 70 years has measured the um, the fat content within, uh, within grinding meat or ground beef. So you blend the two to make a hamburger, which is normally around 76, 77 CL. Um, So in beef, it's proving to be really useful, particularly also because the pricing out front in the physical, you can often get pricing up to three months out, but it's that three to six to 12 month period where pricing is very, very difficult. So a lot of end users are using swaps to manage that price risk out front. And an end user, um, we're talking like a Wendy's or McDonald's or Burger King or someone like that. Exactly. Yeah. Or a Texas Roadhouse or whoever, you know, restaurant chains, you name it. They're all interested in managing risk in this space. And then when we get to pork, um, you know, the cutout is available. It's, it's thinly traded at the moment. And also, once again, we tend to be pricing up hams. 72 CL pork trim, 42 CL pork trim. These are done daily. Um, You know, bellies is another one that's highly volatile. So once again, it's removing that basis risk from the value of the carcass to the individual cut. And for a lot of companies, taking away the basis risk is exactly what they want. So as a swap, we're able to forward price in that three to 12 month period and effectively offset that risk for people. So look, I'm gonna pull on that thread if I can for a minute. So I'm Texas Roadhouse, I'm gonna buy T-bones. We'll keep it simple, right? Of uh, I want a couple million pounds of T-bones. If I just hedge with the outright live cattle futures, I've got two problems, right? One, it's the live cattle, it might fluctuate. Correct. Two, you're saying the basis risk between what comes out of that and maybe for some weird reason everybody wants t-bones and the price of that skyrockets um so how do you run into another problem like last year jeff where yeah suddenly workers get sick and t-bones go through the roof and live cattle fall yeah because they can't suddenly okay um so but there's no how do they lost on your head you've lost both ways so how, how are the hedgers, though, so how do they or not the hedgers, but the people offering those swaps, they they have to go. They don't want that risk. They're not just taking directional risk on the other side. Right. So they're no. building some sort of 
futures market based hedge Correct. themselves for that swap? They're offsetting their risk all day long. Either they're doing it by trying to find like with like, mm. so T bone with T bone, or they've they've done their homework and they've found a customer that's willing to um, look at a cutout, a um, beef cutout value that they're happy with that basis risk. So they may be offering, you know, the sale on the T-bone, but they're buying on the opposite side a carcass um, or a cutout value, and they're wearing that basis risk themselves, and they're happy to do so. If you just follow the supply chain, Jeff, you have obviously the grain and everything goes into the cattle. You've got the feeder cattle, then you've got the live cattle. They go to slaughter, and then they go to slaughterhouse. The slaughterhouse then sells it to a processor, and the processor sells it to the end user. So we got people all along the way like effectively needing to hedge and manage their risk. And so, you know, when you see these transactions all along the way, each time it's, it's laying off risk, lay off risk. And then at the end of the day, um, you know, someone has to bear the other side and it's either going to be a match, like Simon's saying, where they'll, you, I love saying Simon says, you know, Simon <laughs> says jump, Simon says, you know, you know, go fish. But um uh, where the processor needs to kind of, you know, hedge himself or he has to effectively um, uh, find a match, like I say, find a match. And when you do, then they use the swap markets and, to, um, and, and the counterparties to neutralize the risk. And what do you see, right? Like I'm used to talking to people who want to be a fly on the bull's backside, right? Right. Uh, pun intended there, the bull, but right. They don't want to be, they don't want to have any market impact. These are the largest players in the world. They're going to have market impact. So how do they, how do they manage that whole thing? Right. Of like, they're going to be bigger than the the volume that day, or they are the volume of that day uh, in the swap. Not necessarily because the swap is settled against the physical um, product itself. So the USDA weekly average. So, um, No one player in America is that big to impact that weekly sale. So it's all um, settled against um, the physical sales that occur. The USDA are collecting that information, as you know. And to me, it's as robust as you will get in terms of not being overly influenced by any one company. Now, you know, ideally, if you're managing risk, Um, and you're sitting on the other side, the more parts of the animal that you have, so, for example, the T-bone, but if Texas Roadhouse said, you know, I want to also manage um, my hamburger risk as well and and all the other components, then it makes the the price even sharper the more of the carcass that they enable to be Because they can get closer to the futures contract, yeah. Exactly, Exactly, or to... A carcass the market maker or the person trying to offset the risk can get closer to the futures. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. So that it helps the closer you are to the complete cutout, the better, the sharper, the pricing, whether we're talking pork or beef. The other component of, of what we do is I trade the physical market as well, brokerage. And whether it's out of Australia, New Zealand, um, India, or it's throughout North America. So we are in the physical market every day, Jeff. And I think that's the other key component is it's not just research, it's just not analyzing the market, you're living and breathing it every day. And that's absolutely critical. We've effectively got skin in the game. So to me, you know, that separates us potentially from the rest in that we truly hopefully understand the markets that we're in. Yeah. The, uh, I would add the last thing I want to add to that is uh, Jeff, you and I have talked about this with, uh, you know, the floors kind of gone and that's where you started in the business. And, you know, we started working together. That was a breeding ground for people to learn the markets. Now, as I've gotten to know Simon and many of our customers, they are the people that are in these markets every day in the physical side, these transactions are doing the, decisions they have to make, the risk management decisions, the actual trading, the the transactions, it's very much like 
the floor of the old. They have to make these physical trades very quickly and make decisions and it has to be calculated. So perhaps we wonder where the next traders of the markets are going to come from. Maybe it's this physical, maybe it's the physical traders. And do, what does that physical space look like? Just walk us through a trade. You're, you're on the phone. Someone is, wants to buy 6 million pounds of uh, Indian Buffalo and you got to work out the logistics to get it to South Korea or something. Yep. Bids and offers, uh, the quibble, you name it, Jeff, yep. everything that goes with it. Um, do, is there the, uh, do they have the right documentation? meeting all the halal requirements, whatever. So specifications is critical, understanding the meat cuts that you're involved in, making sure that you're delivering, you know, that apple with that apple that they're buying versus, you know, that slightly different banana ends up thinking they bought an apple. Yeah. So you've got to make sure with specifications and meeting market requirements. As I said, you know, whether it's halal or, you name it, if it's a um, uh, organic product, if it's biodynamic, you name it, you have to meet those regulations. Biodynamic, what does that mean? That's the next level up from organic. Got and oh. yeah, that's where superfoods exist. Oh, I love it. And do you do, do you ever consider, any of these people ever consider what managed money is doing, right? Commodity trading advisors, might come in in large size and bid up uh, any one of these futures. Uh, is that just noise in your world, or is that something either you or the hedgers look at to say, "I got to be careful around this level because all this uh, technical buying might come in," or something of that nature? That's definitely been a concern in in you know the life cattle futures, particularly over the last two to three years. And I think you know, like there has been with pork cut out, there's been a strong push to try and have a beef cut out for exactly that reason, Jeff, mm. that the, the number of natural hedges in the market proportionately is getting less and less, and therefore the relevance of the contract starts to get less and less. So there's no doubt that that has been an underlying concern for many years and will continue to be. I mean, people almost make a profession of trying to um, second guess what it should be. Yeah. Um, and the same occurs with hogs. And I think the cutout in a way going into that with hogs is a way to answer that concern. And I would only hope that at some point we get a beef cutout contract. Well, to our CME sponsors, if you're listening, give us the beef cutout contract. Come on. All right, a few other things here. I got it. We got to talk bacon before we let you off because that's <laughs> all we care about here in the states. Is don't mess with my bacon. Um, so what are what's bacon prices look like? That's all tied well, in hog prices. Yeah, up. you've got to really look at the bellies to to give you a, a good, and that is one of those parts of the market that is truly volatile. And it probably the best comparison is fifties and bellies to me. 50s in, in fresh 50s in, in the beef side of things and, and bellies within pork, only because so much of that is driven by that fast food sector, the seasonal demand period, and also it can be um, so easily influenced by exports and other factors. So to answer your question, um, you know, bacon is so tied closely with that bellies market um, what we've seen over the last year is that that retail pricing, um, both in beef and pork, but in um, has seen at times where demand from the re from consumers has been exceptionally high, and there's been a challenge in which to try and bridge that wholesale price and that retail price, and it's been difficult. But I think as we go forward here in the pork sector, anyway the expectation of tightening in the market next year hopefully will help bridge that gap as uh, as the market tightens. And your, all your world travels and all these different countries you deal with on the beef, meat exports, is any country, can they hold a candle to us in terms of our love of bacon? <laughs> um, possibly Canada. 
Um, <laughs> okay. Well, they've got their own. They've got Canadian, Canadian bacon. Yeah. It's just ham. I, I hear you. Um, and I have a particular love of streaky bacon myself. Um, you know, it's funny in Australia, um, we consume on a per capita basis around about 50 kilos a year of chicken. Um, beef sits at about 19 and a half kilos, so less than half. Pork at 27 kilos, and lamb is the lucky last at about six to seven kilos. Wow. So your love of pork may be our love of chicken in Australia. We truly eat a lot of chicken. I, I do this thought experiment with people all the time. I'm like, how many whole chickens do you think you eat a year? And people are like, I don't know, five, 10, 15. I'm like, all right, just call it 10 for the sake of argument. 300 million people, 10 chickens a year, right? Like wow. 3 billion chickens. You'd think all you'd see around the U.S. is trucks full of chickens driving around. And maybe they are, they just don't, right? The feathers aren't flying out the set. <laughs> but that's this whole worldwide thing. Like half the trucks and ships got to be filled with all this meat. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, you know, so let's touch on the um, phase one agreement that you, um, that Donald Trump put in place. And I've got to say, from a meat point of view, and in particular beef, it is probably one of the best agreements that were ever negotiated globally ever. It was extraordinary what you achieved. And as a result of that, you've seen weekly shipments to America go up dramatically. I mean, you've gone from zero to hero. And today you're surpassing Australia as a bigger exporter of beef into China than what we are. And once we, we held that mark. So... The, the expansion of exports out of the US, it now sits at about 14% of your total production is exports in beef. But in actual fact, a value of the carcass, it's more like 25%. So exports for beef in America actually is incredibly important. And you're saying because that we have a higher quality beef, so that the value of it is higher? I think so. And also higher value cuts are being exported. Mm. So that lifts the overall value of the animal um, and the carcass value. Uh, and now let's get into, so a lot of arguments out there, beef is terrible for the planet, takes a lot of water, eats grass, methane, mm. kills the planet, right? So is it ethical to have all this beef? Does anyone care? China doesn't care, right? They're just going to keep, as their GDP grows, as their middle class grows, and all these countries sure. are just going to want more and more beef. So, so that, that leads climate change and beef being bad for the planet with, with the world we sure. live in. Well, let's, let's talk about one of the potential solutions is plant-based proteins. Yeah. Um, the, the company Beyond Meat may ring a, uh, you know, a bell to you. Yeah, KFC has Beyond Chicken. I don't even know. Yep. Uh, what, what is the, that? The Impossible what Burger. Yeah. Um, so, so what we found there was um, that what's developed in the last, um, you know, three or four months. So we had this phenomenal growth in alternate plant proteins last year during COVID, where people were locked up and got very concerned about their health. And the growth in plant-based proteins was astronomical. It was up 120%, 150% compared to 2019. Now we roll the camera forward to this year and it's nowhere near what it was, the demand. In actual fact, growth in that sector for three months in a row is negative. It's down two to 3%. And we're starting to wonder whether the bubble has possibly burst on you know, the, the, the growth and demand of these plant-based. The price proteins. of uh, grains that go into those Beyond Meats through the roof, you know, up 40%, that's you know, naturally gonna cause, uh, cause contraction and demand, right? Prices up. That's correct. 
And, when you, you know, you, when you pull apart the numbers of Beyond Meat, I mean, their sales figures are fantastic, but their profit, they've yet to make a profit in five years or since their conception in 2016. I think their total losses so far are about $63 million. So it, it really does, to me, beg the question whether that part of the market has possibly run its race. Now, in terms of retail sales, um, I think the number is about 83 billion of, you know, um, beef. No, it's they make up 0.5% of the market. So if you look at all retail sales in America, beyond meat and, and the alternate meat uh, plant uh, protein only makes up half a percent of the entire market. One so it's still minute. One half of one uh, percent. Yeah. Correct. Definitely not enough for the CME to launch a Beyond Meat Futures product. Well, that's that correct. Product, it's the it's the soybean crush, but um, but that if I'm on their side, I'm like, hey, that's the whole point, right? If that number goes to eight percent, this is one of the most successful companies of all time. Um, but you're saying like, well, everyone cool. tried it and it's but we, we, now it's coming back down. I think, you know, there's definitely a role and a place for it, and I'm not naive enough to, to think otherwise. I think it's going to be, um, you know, a lot a lot of the time these um, niche items find, a, a, whether it's 5% or whatever it is at the market, it will find its role and its place. But will it be 50% of the protein market? No, it will never be that much. I think that the demand for proteins as we know it globally is far too strong and you know when we look at the expected gdp over the next 10 years and you look at the enormous um, population growth we know that if you look at the imf figures on um, beef needs we fall 8 million tons short globally meeting all the needs of beef for the next 10 years meaning there's just simply not going to be enough beef available globally. The same with pork. I think it sits at about 15 million tonnes for pork and similar for chicken. Simply, the world is growing faster than what protein can keep up with. Uh, and, and is that a, you're tying it back to GDP, so that's a wealth effect also? So that's the correct. more money there's I just, have, the more expensive protein I can buy? Exactly. And, and beef is the perfect example. There's a 98% correlation over the last 30 years between consumption of beef globally and the growth of GDP. And it seems, right, like I'm forgetting, I'm trying to look up on my phone of the, right, an economic substitute. Like there's a fancier word that I'm not thinking of, but the argument for the longest time is like, fine, if beef gets too expensive, I switch to chicken. If chicken, I switch to pork. You're saying maybe people are switching to lamb. So it's all kind of fungible at some level, right? So it part is. of me is like, if we keep, right, if what, if there keeps being drought, if the planet goes to hell in a handbasket rather quickly here, like you almost get forced off beef. Uh, and then it becomes, okay, uh, what's the economic substitute? If it, you know, if beef is six thousand dollars a pound or something ludicrous right because there's only a couple of cows in the world Bold. that's right yeah yeah kangaroos yeah. jeff kangaroos kangaroo the, the market will of course adjust but what we found is that there are three price sensitive markets in the world that will adjust to chicken in preference to beef and pork america australia and japan mm. So right now is a great example where beef prices kept going higher, pork prices kept going higher. So this year, exports into Japan, I think pork is down 4%, beef is down 2%, and chicken is up 6%. And pound for pound, the difference. So if you added the other two that have fallen, it exactly matches the increase in chicken volume. There's a great example, Jeff, where the market will sort itself out. But then you go to somewhere like China, who lost half their hog herd 
Yeah. Chicken prices since 2018 have flatlined in mm. China. Even though pork went through the roof, beef has gone through the roof, chicken remained flatlined in price. It's the poor man's meat. Yeah, there right. is, you know, every man and his dog, though, wants to eat beef. That is the, it's got a lot of status. It, they believe it's good for their children. You name it. They want their beef. So every market's different. And as supply gets tighter globally or demand grows with the population, you know, my feeling is that beef will continue to be a dominant player in the market. And I'm expecting that the peak in global beef prices will be 2023. And my expectation is we're looking at around about an 8% increase on, to, on this year's average over the next two years for beef to, to be 8% higher in value. And all of that is not based on inflation whatsoever, right? Like you're not saying this is a macro call. This is just based on the local supply de demand dynamics. Um, Correct. Which is we, a leading question of where do you, what is the inflation picture due to the, that whole thing? Well, I think it just fuels it even more, you know, yeah. and, and we could talk about the super demand cycle about where, you know, I've got a graph that I was to um, put up, but instead I'm holding it. Um, yeah. Yeah. But if you were to look at every individual component um, in terms of commodities, still this year on year is up 275%. Oil out of um, soybean oil, 139. Pork bellies, 134%. The list goes on and on. So the question is, are we part of a larger super commodity cycle? Um, that has longevity. I think there's so much about today that resembles the 70s when demand was through the roof. Yet the difference is that beef supply went up in the 70s and I'm expecting beef supply to fall. So therefore a sustained period of global beef prices probably for about eight years. And that includes last year and this year. So another six years to go before ramping higher, before who knows before, what happens. Before probably falling lower. Ah, but um, you know, eventually the demand and supply will get back into it. But it's going to be a sustained period of strong global demand for most meat items, but in particular beef. I love it. And then I'll let you, I know you have a little, uh, a little lamb, I was about to say. A little, no, that was Mary. You had a little lamb. Um, that you have a little lamb soapbox that you uh, shared with me the other oh. day. So give me, give me your lamb pitch. My lamb pitch is that lamb is now the new wagon, and uh, by that we mean that lamb, in terms of demand and the education, particularly of the U.S. consumer, they have fallen in love with lamb over the last year. So sales out of Australia of lamb since January this year, if you look at lamb racks, lamb legs, shank, are up somewhere around 160% in volume. Mm -hmm. So it truly is that the love affair with lamb is on and it's found itself at that niche end of the market. The average value in terms of through retail outlets sits at around $9.80 per pound for lamb. And beef, I think, sits just at around about above $6, $6.20 US cents a pound on average. So there's your price differential hmm. with the average value. Um, What's you know, it just produce? Uh, from an Australian point of view, um, I think given the... Uh, I guess high price, record prices of cattle. And if you're trading here, lamb is looking far more attractive. And I think over the next five years, there'll be a migration across to more lamb. So sounds like a little bit of a homer bias there, Jeff. I got to yeah. be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, isn't New Zealand's big lamb producer, right? They are. So between Australia and New Zealand, we produce about 80% of the global lamb production. Oh, yeah, he's, um, yeah, he's talking up his book. He's talking exactly, up his book. Exactly. So uh, the size of the New Zealand flock 
it sits at about 24, 25 million. Wow. We sit, we're at 20, 64 million in Australia. And the US is at 5 million and it's falling. Oh, wow. Okay. Nobody wants lamb here. Um, well, it's, it's struggled in your environment for whatever reason. I have one more question, Simon. Did you purposely color coordinate the red filing cabinet, the red binders back there, and this red uh, folder organizer there? It's very <laughs> nicely done. If you looked at the rest of the room and my underpants, you'd find that they're all red. <laughs> Perfect. All right, some quick favorites before we let you go. Favorite color? Blue and red. <laughs> Let's say red. Uh, favorite uh, Australian custom or, yeah, favorite Australian custom. Beer drinking? Beer <laughs> drinking. Perfect. Um, what's, what's your favorite beer down there, down under? Um, we have many. The VB is popular, Victorian bitter. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's stick with VB just to make life easy. Okay. Favorite Australian athlete? Oh, um, well, we have many good cricketers in Australia. Um, dare I say, um, yes, probably one of the um, our cricketers. Uh, yes, we'll just leave it as uh, okay. one, <laughs> one of the you caught me on the spot. Yeah. I wanted one of the uh, female uh, Olympic swimmers. Uh, I can't Ooh. remember her name now, but uh, she was good. I don't think they're available. Okay. Uh, favorite restaurant in Melbourne? Well, we love Indian no matter where it is. So um, there's a number of restaurants, Indian, all through Melbourne, and each of them are very good. Love it. Uh, favorite Australian band? There's only one right answer. In Excess? Oh, good. I, there's two right answers. Okay, In Excess. I was going to go with Men at Work. Oh, yeah, that's true. They're not bad. Um yeah. All right. Midnight oil. <laughs> Midnight oil. You're good. Uh, <laughs> or dare um, I say, the, the Wiggles is the last Wiggles. one. Oh, That's yeah. Like, those guys were making like $10 million a year at the end. Of, that was brilliant. Um, and lastly, favorite uh, Star Wars character. You can look on my, you can look on the cheat board here behind me if you need to. Yeah. Um, I will go with R2-D2 if that's... um. Yeah. R2-D2. Love it. Um, all right, Simon. It's been fun. Uh, I've had on every time I talk to you, I tell you I'm going to come visit you, but I will. One of these days. and get out there. Uh, Melbourne's the only place in Australia I haven't been. Well, not the only, but the only main city I haven't been. So it's on my list. Perfect. Thank you, all Jeff right. and Jeff. All right, Thank Jeff. you. Thanks for having us. The Derivative is brought to you by CME Group. CME Group is the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures and options, visit cmegroup.com. You've been listening to The Derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at rcmalt and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at rcmalt.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you.